Senhoras e senhores, boa tarde. É com satisfação que a Reitoria da Universidade Tecnológica Federal do Paraná, a Pró-Reitoria de Pesquisa e Pós-Graduação, a Direção-Geral do Campus Curitiba, por meio da Diretoria de Pesquisa e Pós-Graduação e a Escola de Gestão e Economia, recebem todos para esta solenidade de abertura da décima mostra de pesquisa na pós-graduação, que neste ano compartilha também a programação juntamente com as atividades do segundo Fórum de Gestão e Economia da Universidade Tecnológica Federal do Paraná. A mostra tem como propósito divulgar as atividades desenvolvidas em pesquisa e pós-graduação no campus Curitiba e, ainda, fomentar a discussão de temas de interesse comum nas palestras, workshops e minicursos durante este evento. Além disso, a mostra reunirá informações e discussões vinculadas aos seguintes programas, administração pública, administração, ciências e tecnologia ambiental, computação aplicada, educação física, engenharia biomédica, engenharia civil, engenharia elétrica e informática industrial, engenharia mecânica e de materiais, estudos de linguagens, física e astronomia, formação científica, educacional e tecnológica, matemática em rede nacional, planejamento e governança pública, química, sistemas de energia e tecnologia. Convidamos a seguir, para compor a mesa de honra de abertura desta solenidade, as seguintes autoridades. Convidamos a excelentíssima vice-reitora da Universidade Tecnológica Federal do Paraná, professora Vanessa Ishikawa Razoto, que neste ato também representa o magnífico reitor da Universidade, professor Luiz Alberto Pilati. Com igual satisfação, convidamos o excelentíssimo pró-reitor de pesquisa e pós-graduação da Universidade Tecnológica, professor Valdir Fernandes. Convidamos o ilustríssimo assessor de pós-graduação Estricto Senso, professor Alexandre Moeckel, representando a diretoria de pesquisa e pós-graduação do Campus Curitiba. E convidamos o ilustríssimo chefe em exercício do Departamento Acadêmico de Gestão e Economia, professor Paulo Daniel Batista de Souza. Agradecemos as presenças das demais autoridades acadêmicas dessa instituição, convidados, ilustres membros desta plateia. Convidamos para proferir a declaração de abertura oficial dessa décima mostra, a professora Vanessa Razotto, vice-reitora da Universidade Tecnológica. Boa tarde, sejam todos muito bem-vindos à nossa Universidade Tecnológica Federal do Paraná. Declaro aberta essa sessão de abertura da décima mostra de pesquisa na pós-graduação. Convidamos a todos, neste momento, para, em posição de respeito, cantarmos o hino nacional brasileiro.
Convidamos para fazer uso da palavra o representante da Diretoria de Pesquisa e Pós-Graduação do Campus Curitiba, professor Alexandre Moekel. Boa tarde a todos. É uma satisfação estar aqui, não apenas representando a, a, o professor Júlio na Diretoria de Pesquisa, mas também o professor Schickler, da direção do campus, na abertura desse evento. E a nossa expectativa é trazer para mais próximo da nossa comunidade acadêmica as atividades de pesquisa que são realizadas nos programas de pós-graduação e grupos de pesquisa do campus. Então, nós estamos realizando essa semana em conjunto com atividades das semanas acadêmicas, dos cursos de graduação, com o propósito de aumentar essa sinergia, despertar talentos ali de, quem sabe, uma iniciação científica e um futuro a, ingresso num programa nosso de pós-graduação, né, visando né, forma, formar pesquisadores, né, consolidar essas pesquisas, e, na sequência, nós vamos ter a privilégio da palestra aí do professor Ryan a respeito de como publicar melhor, né, melhorar nossos indicadores de produção. Então, nós estamos né, nessa trilha aí, nesse caminho de fomentar essa publicação e dar esse retorno à sociedade a partir das pesquisas que são realizadas na instituição. Obrigado. Passamos a palavra ao representante do Departamento da Economia do Campus Curitiba, professor Paulo Daniel Batista de Souza. Boa tarde a todos. É, com um imenso prazer que a gente está aqui representando o Departamento da AISH. Esse evento é bastante importante para a gente, essa parceria, né, essa, esse evento em conjunto com a, com a mostra de pesquisa de pós-graduação. É, eu acho que é uma oportunidade única essa a, a possibilidade dos nossos alunos e dos nossos, dos nossos alunos convidados de outras instituições conhecer os nossos programas de estrito senso e ver é, e conhecer as pesquisas que estão acontecendo no campus. É, a gente aproveita a oportunidade e agradeço toda a equipe que está auxiliando, que para fazer o evento precisa de horas e reuniões extensas de preparação. Então, nós temos esses iniciando hoje até sexta-feira, tendo uma série de eventos. Então, eu desejo a todos que aproveitem as, as palestras, os workshops, os minicursos que estão disponíveis. É, a gente só tem a agradecer e espero que vocês aproveitem. Obrigado. Convidamos para fazer uso da palavra o excelentíssimo pró-reitor de pesquisa e pós-graduação da Universidade Tecnológica, professor Valdir Fernandes. Boa tarde a todos, professor. Welcome in, in our uh, university uh, and uh, good job here. Uh, good churrasco uh, and beer uh, and the others uh, possibilities uh, uh, we we have aqui we we have in Brazil, uh, especially in Curitiba. Um, aos alunos, principalmente, eu vinha pensando né, o que, que se fala na abertura da amostra de pesquisa, professora Vanessa, professor Alexandre. O que, que, se, é, que, que a gente fala né, para os alunos? Eu sempre fico me perguntando isso. Né, aqueles que têm aula comigo é, é, se divertem um pouco com as minhas perguntas, né, porque eu gosto de brincar, porque eu não tenho respostas, normalmente só tenho perguntas. Né, as respostas a gente deve atras, buscar através da pesquisa. E o que, que é a pesquisa numa universidade? Por que, que a gente faz pesquisa? Né? É, e vocês estão sentados em cima de um fruto de uma pesquisa. Né? Uma cadeira, a ergonomia de uma cadeira, a sustentação do peso é resultado de uma pesquisa. Não sei onde foi feito, mas em algum momento alguém é, fez os cálculos, definiu os parâmetros de, de sustentação de uma cadeira, definiu a ergonomia que melhor poderia servir, definiu o uso do espaço e outras coisas. Isso é pesquisa. O celular que hoje 
nós temos na mão é resultado de pesquisa. Então, se a gente olhar para o lado, quase tudo origina-se da pesquisa. O som, né? a física, tudo vem daí. E o que, que nós fazemos num programa de pós-graduação? Bom, a gente faz pesquisa. A pesquisa na pós-graduação é um ato pedagógico, é um processo pedagógico através do qual nós aprendemos algumas habilidades e competências. Não é fábrica de paper. Eu sei que, de vez em quando, vocês escutam isso. Estão sendo escravizados para produzir papers, agora ainda mais papers fora do Brasil. Não, sei. não. calma. Os papers são resultado de um processo pedagógico. Quanto melhor o paper, possivelmente melhor a interação com o orientador, com o programa onde a gente está, e com, porque foi melhor a pesquisa. E por que a gente busca impacto, então, da pesquisa? Por que a gente quer saber... Se, bom, nós queremos saber, o impacto é nada mais é do que a gente saber quantas pessoas leram e utilizaram a pesquisa que nós fizemos. É só isso, mais nada. Eu sempre gosto de lembrar, às vezes, na pró-reitoria, a gente brinca, né? é, o que, que é uma publicação? Por que, que a gente publica? Bom... Quando a gente era criança e fazia uma descoberta, o que, que a gente fazia? Saía correndo contar para a mãe da descoberta que a gente fez. Daí nós ficamos um pouquinho mais velhos e fazemos descobertas. Corremos e contamos para os colegas, no colégio, onde for. Aí ficamos um pouquinho mais grandinhos, vamos para a universidade e fazemos uma descoberta. A gente vai contar sempre para os pares, sempre para aqueles que estão por... O que é a publicação? A publicação nada mais é a gente contar o resultado de um processo, de uma conquista que a gente fez, de uma descoberta, a uma comunidade que entenderá essa descoberta. E aí a gente vai ficar torcendo para que essa comunidade dê importância para a nossa descoberta. E que, ao buscar a sua descoberta, diz, olha, eu estou buscando aqui, mas vejam, a descoberta de fulano foi importante. E assim, e aí vira a citação. Por que, que eu falo isso? Porque existe um discurso paralelo ao nosso de que nós somos obrigados a produzir um paper pelo paper. Então, vira uma obrigação, uma coisa ruim, uma coisa desprazerosa. Não é por isso que a gente publica. A gente publica porque a gente quer ser ouvido. Então, quando a gente vem para uma amostra de pesquisa, eu sinto falta de muitos alunos que eu conheço aqui, eu gostaria que esse editório tivesse abarrotado. Eu esperaria que todos estivéssemos nesse evento querendo contar para os outros o que a gente está fazendo. E os outros poderem dizer, olha, isso pode ser melhorado aqui, isso pode ser melhorado lá, ou, oh, parabéns, que bom, puxa, como você avançou, eu ainda não avancei tanto. Então, essa troca... Né? que é muito importante. Evidentemente que tem fábrica de papers, tem coisas espúrias, mas nós não precisamos fazer parte disso. Eu fico muito feliz quando... E eu estou terminando, professora, para não me expandir, mas, como é a amostra de pesquisa, eu me senti na obrigação de fazer essa fala. Então, eu, toda vez que, um, que eu consigo é, que uma dissertação ou uma tese se transforme num paper que vai para uma revista em que uma comunidade científica considera prestigiada, atingia meu objetivo. Esse, esse, esse aluno está formado. Ele conseguiu fazer um caminho. Sim, vai ter que aprender muita coisa. Eu, todo dia a gente aprende. Mas... É, esse é o caminho que, que eu vejo como a pesquisa como um processo pedagógico dentro da, da universidade, uma parte importante. Não se forma doutores em sala de aula e não se forma mestre em sala de aula, se forma na pesquisa. É a pesquisa que forma essas pessoas. E um bom mestre, certamente, se for para uma indústria, vai ser um bom, é, é, um bom é, trabalhador nessa indústria, no sentido mais pleno do trabalho. Se for para a universidade, certamente será um bom professor. Né? Se for para a política, eu espero 
se nada acontecer no caminho, seja um bom político. Então, bem-vindos a esse evento. Professor, espero que possamos, de fato, é, usufruir do, dos seus conhecimentos e que possa trazer essa mensagem também, como na Inglaterra, é, como os países... É importante dizer, não conheço nenhum país desenvolvido em que a pesquisa não seja muito desenvolvida. Nenhum. É, não existe. Né? E que não dialogue muito com o resto do mundo. Então, bom evento, muito obrigado pela, pela atenção e espero que a gente consiga, com esse evento, dar mais um passo pequenininho, né, no sentido de dialogarmos com quem vem de fora, mas também de produzirmos essa disposição de dialogar com a sociedade e com o resto do país. É... Professora Vanessa. Convidamos na sequência para fazer uso da palavra a excelentíssima vice-reitora da Universidade Tecnológica, professora Vanessa Rasotto. Boa tarde novamente. É uma grande alegria estar aqui presente. Gostaria de cumprimentar o nosso pró-reitor de pesquisa e pós-graduação, professor Valdir, que, particularmente para nós da reitoria, né, é uma grande honra que ele esteja participando da, da gestão, até porque ele faz parte do programa de pós-graduação em tecnologia, o PPGTE, e ele tem um olhar de fora também, afinal, ele foi um dos diretores da CAPES, então ele entende bastante da questão da pesquisa, e a gente precisava desse olhar também para que a gente pudesse melhorar a nossa gestão. Gratidão por ter aceito né, o convite e fazer parte também. Gostaria aqui de cumprimentar também a Alexandre Mock, um amigo de longa data, né, na qual a gente já conseguiu trabalhar há muito tempo juntos, que eu tenho profunda admiração pelo seu trabalho. Né? Por favor, leve o nosso abraço ao nosso digníssimo diretor, Marcos Flávio de Oliveira Chifra Filho, né? que, nesse momento, ele não esteve impossibilitado de estar aqui presente. Quero cumprimentar também né, o meu chefe, né? o professor Paulo, né? aqui hoje como chefe em exercício do Departamento de Gestão e Economia, né, na qual também sou professora vinculada ao Departamento de Gestão e Economia, aos colegas que estão aqui presentes, professor Igor, Jurandir, né, deixa eu ver quem mais que está aqui. Eu tinha visto... Ah, sim, a, a professora Maria Clara, né, do, do não, não, não. da Cláudia, do da INF, Magatal, eu tinha visto a professora Giovana. Ali, ali. <risos> perfeito. Né, Reache também, né? Perdão se, de repente, eu não citar todos os nomes, né? mas é que a emoção é grande, sabe? Eu não sei se vocês... Eu gosto de quebrar um pouquinho o protocolo, mas esses óculos aqui, esses olhos puxados, assim, às vezes, saem algumas lágrimas assim, de emoção, e aí a gente não enxerga direito. Como é que pode? né? Quero cumprimentar também e agradecer a presença né, do professor Ian. Welcome to UTFPR. Né? É, realmente é uma grande honra ter todos vocês aqui, estudantes, pesquisadores... Por favor, me permitam falar um pouquinho sobre a nossa UTFPR. Pedir para o Igor, se for possível, ir traduzindo para a Iua. Né? A Iua. Uh, nós somos uma universidade, professor Tiago, seja bem-vindo, <risos> Ricardo. Aí, é bom assim, né? porque a professora chega aqui na frente e vai fazendo chamada, não sei se vocês perceberam isso. né? <risos> então, a nossa UTFPR é diferenciada das outras universidades. Nascemos em 1909, mas fiquem tranquilos que eu não vou ficar falando da história desde 1909. Né? Mas a nossa história, embora ela seja secular e tenha iniciado nas escolas, na Escola de Aprendizes e Artífices, nós não nascemos universidade. Portanto, nós fomos transformados em universidade. Isso, digamos assim, faz um grande diferencial com relação às outras universidades. Porque somos centenária, mas a bem verdade é que, enquanto universidade, nós só temos, vamos completar 13 anos. Né? Isso significa dizer o seguinte, que muitos indicadores para ser a primeira universidade federal do Brasil, puxa, são as universidades, digamos assim, maduras. Né? Não são jovens universidades, que são aquelas que têm menos de 30 anos. Né? E, para nós, sendo bem sincera, né? estamos chegando a 38 mil estudantes quase 4 mil servidores, né? entre técnicos administrativos e professores. Mas nós começamos, diria assim, o segundo semestre em grande estilo. Por que em grande estilo? Porque, pela primeira vez, a nossa universidade 
o nosso Cefet, como, como muitos conhecem, entram nos rankings internacionais, no D, Times Higher Education. Né? Diria assim, puxa, mas a gente não entrava. Não, a gente não entrava nesses rankings. Né? E estar na 49ª colocação entre as melhores instituições, as melhores universidades da América Latina, puxa, é motivo de orgulho, sim. Claro que queremos mais. Né? Tenho certeza disso, todos querem mais. Né? Mas é motivo de orgulho por quê? Porque, em pesquisa, se não me engano, me ajuda aqui, nós ficamos em 29ª colocação. Né? E, ao mesmo tempo, na, em 30 colocação em atração de investimentos. Sabia, Paulo? Né? O Paulo, né, sendo chefe do Departamento de Gestão e Economia, ele é um dos professores que, eu digo assim, ele tem amor à causa. Né? Ele gosta de fazer algo que está na nossa essência que é a relação com a indústria, que é a relação com o mundo do trabalho. Então, ele gosta de fazer as parcerias com as empresas, e aí o DAGE entra junto. Né? Cursos em company, na especialização, e assim vai como vários professores aqui fazem. Né? Então, nós não podemos esquecer do nosso DNA, que é ajudar a sociedade, a indústria. Né? Mas também quero falar para vocês que, mesmo sendo nova, um outro ranking muito importante para nós é o RUF, que é da Folha de São Paulo. Né? E, no RUF, nós estamos entre as dez melhores universidades federais do país. Mas, como sendo jovem universidade, aquelas que, como já disse, têm menos de 30 anos, nós estamos em segundo lugar. Sabe para quem que nós perdemos, gente? Para a Federal do ABC. Mas por que, que eu estou falando isso? Porque, a bem verdade, a Federal do ABC nasce com uma forma diferente de contratação específica de professores né, oriundos da USP e da Unicamp. Faz um diferencial, não faz? Não é verdade? Né? E nós trazemos esse histórico né, em termos de instituição federal. E, se nós formos olhar, nós somos a instituição federal mais antiga do Paraná, por incrível que pareça. E esses indicadores que eu trago para vocês, né, inclusive hoje teve uma defesa de uma dissertação de mestrado, em que se trabalhava a questão do planejamento né, numa instituição pública e, ao mesmo tempo, resultado avaliando o PDI. Né, o último nosso PDI, que foi até o ano 2017. E aí, é claro, né, você começa a trabalhar um pouquinho. Né, e como fazer planejamento estratégico uma instituição pública? Difícil, não? Ainda mais no Brasil, na é verdade. Quando você tenta fazer alguma coisa de longo prazo, o negócio muda, você quer fazer um investimento, pensando, puxa, você vai fazer? Não, peraí, você não tem mais orçamento. Né? É isso que a gente passa. Né? Mas nem por isso a gente desiste, não é mesmo? A UTFPR é uma das instituições que, embora a crise econômica esteja aí, é uma das instituições que menos tem, entre aspas, né, digamos assim, que não, não esteja conseguindo cumprir os seus resultados. Nós não temos nenhuma obra parada. Né? A gestão ela é cautelosa. Né? Por quê? Por uma preocupação com a coisa pública. Então, tenho certeza que esses indicadores se devem exatamente por profissionais, por pessoas, independente do seu cargo. Vocês, estudantes, também são responsáveis por isso. Porque o primeiro lugar no conceito médio da graduação vem por vocês também. Vem os professores maravilhosos, os técnicos administrativos apoiando aqui, os pesquisadores, mas vocês também que né, estudaram, foram lá, fizeram né, o ENAD e tiraram uma nota boa. Fantástico. Né? E agora vocês aqui na pós-graduação. Né? Então, existe um zelo com a coisa pública. E nós, da UTFPR, somos assim. Tenho certeza que todos os professores, todos os servidores que estão aqui, Querem mais, querem mais para o TFPR, não é mesmo, Jurandir? Não é isso? Magatal, né? não queremos mais? O 49 lugar, legal, entramos, mas nós queremos ser, quem sabe, estar entre os 10 primeiros. Ou ainda, quem sabe, entrar entre as mil universidades melhores do mundo? Por que não sonhar? Né? Porque, afinal, nós nos colocamos, né, em termos de gestão, para ser uma universidade classe mundial rumo à classe mundial. E eu acho que nós já estamos aí no caminho, sim. O caminho é certo. Né? Quero aqui dizer para vocês que vocês tenham uma ótima, um ótimo evento, uma ótima mostra. Porque não é tão trivial assim né? escrever alguma coisa, né? ser aprovado e agora apresentar. Gente, faz parte da vida. Né? E queremos mais de vocês, sim. Porque, olhando para vocês, muitos daqui eu já olho, já conheço, e sei a quanto, quanto competente vocês são. Então, eu tenho certeza que essa mostra, sabe, Mocky, será um grande sucesso. Valdir, mais uma vez, obrigada. Gratidão a vocês. E que a gente possa, sim, mostrar para o país 
que o problema do país não são as universidades públicas, não são os servidores públicos, por favor. Nos ajude a levar a nossa Universidade Tecnológica Federal do Paraná, mostrando a seriedade que nós temos em termos de profissionais, gestão. Porque, quando a gente fala classe mundial, a gente quer isso. Excelência na gestão, excelência na pesquisa, excelência na extensão, excelência na graduação, excelência em tudo. E, para isso, é um caminhar. Né? Então, a todos vocês, paz e bem, um ótimo evento. Neste momento, desfazemos a mesa de honra, agradecendo a importante presença das ilustres autoridades da mesa. Convidamos gentilmente a ocuparem seus lugares junto à plateia, para que possamos, assim, dar sequência aos trabalhos. A palestra de abertura desta mostra será proferida pelo professor doutor Ian Hodgkinson, da Universidade de Loughborough, do Reino Unido, que nos apresentará o tema, acelerando sua carreira acadêmica e publicando nos principais periódicos e revistas. Professor Ian é docente da Escola de Gestão e Economia da Universidade de Loughborough, atua como editor e revisor das seguintes publicações, Jornal de Gestão de Serviços, Revista de Gestão de Inovação de Produtos, Administração Pública, Revista Britânica de Gestão e Revisão de Serviços de Investigação. Eu gostaria de convidar o professor Igor Leite, para que, por gentileza, subisse o palco, para nos falar mais sobre o palestrante e sua palestra. Obviamente, esse não é o meu currículo, tá? não é ainda, ok? mas tenho certeza que, trabalhando com o Ian e com essas atividades que acontecem na universidade, a gente vai elevar o nível né, da universidade. E só antes que eu comece a, a falar inglês, que eu já falei para o Ian que eu ia fazer essa introdução, ele só me falou, Igor, antes de eu vir para cá, eu chequei, eu dei uma olhada no, no ranking da universidade de vocês entre os BRICS, né, que é Brasil, Rússia... China, Índia e África do Sul. E vocês estão entre os 180 uh, melhores universidades do, dos BRICS. Né? Então, isso é um, algo importante para nós. ok? Então, eu vou só agora falar inglês e, a partir de agora, toda a palestra vai ser em inglês. Uh, o Ian... Uh, Ian, just explain what you said about your accent and if they don't understand, they can... You know. O Ian, gentilmente, né, é, disse que, se vocês não entenderem, né, fiquem à vontade de, de, de perguntar, ele não se incomoda. Ok? É, as perguntas também, se vocês não quiserem fazer a pergunta, de repente em inglês, ou quiserem escrever e passar para mim aqui, eu traduzo para ele sem nenhum problema, ok? Então, fiquem à vontade. Quantos minutos o professor Ian tem para essa apresentação? Ele queria saber. Vocês sabem? É, uma hora. So you have one hour, Ian, ok? Um, uma hora considerando perguntas também. É. One hour as you, as, you, as you want, ok? And then we can have 15 minutes of Q&A. Right. Um, para o pessoal que está gravando lá, ele me perguntou se a gente tem um para passar slides aqui. Como que é passar slides? Está aqui? Uh, embaixo? Está no computador? Oh, se alguém puder... Ah, aqui embaixo, aqui, ok. Ok. Um, ah, o clique, ok. Um, deixa eu ver se está funcionando. A outra coisa, a gente está gravando isso também, né? A única coisa que ele pediu é que existem, acho que, três slides que ele escreveu com outro autor e ele pediu, ele não pediu autorização desse autor para é, publicar. Hã? Eu sei, a única coisa é que ele não quer que, que grave essa parte que ele vai pedir. Ele vai pedir para parar de gravar e depois retornar, ok? Daí eu aviso, para e retorna de novo, só porque o outro autor não deu consentimento ainda, então ele não quer que depois publique algo, né? So, um, it's just my, I mean, I'm very, I'm delighted to, to have you here, Ian, okay? Um, I met Ian four years ago when I went to England to do my PhD. It was a great time for me. I was, I told him when I, when I arrived there, I was a little bit scared because everything was new and huge university, one of the top five universities in the UK, um, a massive uh, interaction uh, between students and academics. Uh, a lot of researching going on, and very soon I found my place there, representing uh, as a student representative of the of the CSM, uh, Center for Service Management. So I got involved to this uh, in this center of research, and then I met Ian, and then I had the opportunity to discuss with him, and his 
I'll, I'll say the greatest contribution, Ian, that you made to my career or to my PhD, I'll tell you, probably don't remember that, but I was having my lunch at the canteen. We had like actually a small kitchen. I was having my lunch there because we used to bring our, our food with us. So Ian came and I said, hey Ian, how are you doing? He said, I'm fine. I'm just uh, you know, a little bit like stressed now that I'm writing up my research and writing up my thesis. And he said, oh, you're, I'm gonna tell you something. You can't forget to bring your literature to the, your conclusion and discussion. Actually, it was discussion. He said, make sure you show to your examiners that in your discussion, your discussions match with the literature and you can support your claims um, that way. So that was great, because I went to, to, the next week probably I went to, to Zoe, which was my supervisor, and I said, look, I need to, to put this uh, literature here, and she said, oh, that's great. I said, yeah, it's great, Ian told me. <laughs> Ian gave me this idea. She said, it's really good, it's really good that, it, that you speak with other um, researchers, that we, you know, we don't work alone. You can't be lonely when you are doing your PhD. Uh, and that was a great contribution. So um, I really admire Ian. He just became a professor uh, at the university. And um, I congratulate you now uh, in public, Ian. So, and I'm, I'm, I'm delighted and happy that you were here. Thank you very much indeed for coming to this uh, event and tomorrow as well. I hope you enjoy your short stay here, okay? I'll make sure you drink a lot of caipirinhas, you have a lot of churrasco, okay? Why else do you stay here? Uh, make yourself at home, so I'd like to invite you there now, okay? And just put your hands together now to receive Professor Ian, please. Thank you very much, Hugo. Now, if at any point you'd like to interrupt or ask a question, please do. I will try and go at a steady pace, um, but I'm sure there'll be uh, some instances where I end up talking too quickly or start going off on a random story about something. So please do shout at me if that is what happens. My talk today is very much about the power of research, ultimately. I wouldn't be here today, standing in front of you, if it wasn't for my research. If I was a, uh, just a fantastic teacher, for instance, you'd never have heard of me or I wouldn't be here. To me, research is what really opens the world to us as, in to us as institutions. And listening to those speeches uh, that we started with, there's great potential here, I think, to really unlock that and to really build an international presence. Research is fundamental to that. Now, whether you're an undergraduate student, a postgraduate student doing your PhD, whether you're a junior academic, whether you're a professor, I'd hope that what I talk about in today's workshop will have some benefit to you. Um, so let's, uh, let's get started. I've split this workshop into three parts, ultimately. The first is about the research pipeline. Uh, the second really is about a career in academia and about how you manage and balance all the different demands that you'll have on your time. And then the last and final section is about how do you get into those very top academic journals? Because ultimately, if we can publish our research in the top journals, that makes sure that we as individuals are being recognized on the international level, but also that our universities are also being recognized at those levels. So I'm going to start with the pipeline. Now, to me, the pipeline is one of the most important things that you can uh, develop, and it is the one thing which will ensure that you are successful. Of all the different things that we do as, as academics, even as professors, it's the research pipeline. It matters as much to me now as a professor as it does to when I started out as a lecturer. But even before then, when I started uh, on my PhD journey. Now, there's a certain context that exists within higher education and within academia. Now, I work at Loughborough University, which, as Igor was saying, is a top five university in the United Kingdom. 
the top universities in the UK and the top ones in the US as well as in Asia, they're research intensive universities. That means they are uh, consistently publishing top quality research quality outlets. Now that's pressure, and that's why at the very top of this slide, research is there. Research matters most to those sorts of universities. As this university grows and develops, that research also grow and develop with it. It's a, it's, a, it's a necessary, it's almost a necessary evil. It's something which we very much enjoy doing and, and love doing, but at the same time, pressure, pressure there to, to maintain that research standing, to maintain that research profile. Now, I'll reflect a lot of my experiences. I, that's not to say that you'll have the same sort of experience as me, but again, I'd hope that there could be some, uh, some learning points for you from what I have gone through. Now, teaching, for me, is equally important to the research. I always aspire to be a great teacher. I think it's very sad if we get into a situation where we pursue re research at all costs, because ultimately we're here to educate, and those students who are in the room, you're here to get an education. We should never lose sight of that. In addition, enterprise. We call it enterprise. Uh, I'm not sure if you have a different terminology for this, but working with local communities trying to improve the lives of those that live around us, trying to help small organisations, trying to um, make life better for people. Again, another big uh, pressure that's put upon us. But within the university structure, so for those of you that go into academia as a profession, and those of you that are already in it, you'll know that we're expected to contribute a lot to the university whether that be through program management of a master's program, for instance, whether it be through mentoring or coaching undergraduate students or postgraduate students, again, demands our time. And lastly, things like administration, so the little things, so turning up at recruitment events or writing references for our students. So that's the context to try and understand where research happens and the different pressures that are upon us. Okay, the importance of the pipeline. Now, uh, being someone that strives to publish and has published in the top journals, um, the sources of information that you use are very important. I wouldn't recommend relying on the, the businessdictionary.com. Uh, it's not the, the most uh, academic of sources, uh, but it did provide a very nice definition of what a pipeline is. An activity that is between the starting point and the completion point. That sounds very simple, but when we apply it to research, this is what ultimately we're talking about. How do you get from that initial uh, conception of an idea, of a research project, through to publishing that research in a top journal? That is an activity. It can be a very laborious activity and a very difficult process to go through. I'm gonna try and explain some of that now. Why am I focusing on this? Again, I want you to think about research as allowing you to be a part of an international community. When we think about research, we don't think about it just in the Brazilian context or just in the UK, UK context. When we're doing our research, we're constantly thinking, what benefit will this have for the world? And that might sound overly ambitious, but actually that's the mentality that you have to have because you want other people out there in the academic community to read your work. You want them to get value from your work. And that's the quite, I guess, the idealistic way of thinking about this. But for you as an individual, you want to progress. You want to be recognized for the work that you do. You want to build that international profile. You want to build collaborations. So going back to my first point, I wouldn't be here today if it weren't for my research. The research builds collaborations. It builds that network. And to me, that's what's most exciting about research, is that you're talking here. It's not so in a very close boundary. PhD paralysis. So for those of you that are going through your PhD at the moment, for those of you that may be now try and publish off it, Again, there's a big data. After your PhD, you 
The PhDs are... So how do you make sure that that effort you invested leads into future projects, future papers, um, future relationships? So this is the aim, ultimately. So when we think about research and making the most of it, whether this is your master's research, whether it's research that you're undertaking now, as a, even as a professor, you might have a new project or your PhD thesis. How do we turn that into publications? Because again, that's ultimately which we want to get good I'm focusing on today. Now you'll see there that there's six journal articles, but there's only say two projects and one PhD thesis. So you've got three over here and six over the other side. The objective, what we're trying to accomplish is with a bit of magic, turning your project, turning your research into multiple outputs. Now this is a really key point. Your PhD thesis or your new research project, that is not one paper. You shouldn't think about your work as simply being a one output um, process. Why? Well, you invest an awful lot of time in your PhD. You invest an awful lot of time in new projects. If you were to simply just get one output from that, that's not really a great return on investment, if you want to think about it in a business sense. So what you're trying to do here is get the biggest gain or the biggest return on your effort and on the research work that you do. Now, a little bit of magic does really help here, hence the wand. But unfortunately, in the real world, no one is standing there next to you with this magic wand. So how do we do this? Because this is ultimately the aim. So remember, your PhD thesis or your research project is not one paper. Start with that mentality. So what do I mean by that? The work that you do will have different components to it. If we take a, a traditional uh, PhD thesis, it will have a review of literature. It will have a strong method section. It might have two phases of data collection. It might have a very lengthy discussion. The discussion might focus on theoretical contributions, but it might, might also have a strong focus on practical implications. Straight away, you're seeing different sections of your PhD thesis there that actually could be turn into outputs, into research papers. It's exactly the same with any new project you start because typically new research projects tend to have a similar structure to what a PhD thesis might have also from an initial review of the literature, identifying your research gaps, thinking about appropriate methods, possibly going through the two phases of data collection. Now, importantly, will be distinguishable. And the, the aim for you is to think about how do you position those different component pieces to get them published. And that's easier said than done. But if you can think in that way, what you start to recognize is, oh, hang on a minute, I have this research project. But actually here, I'm talking to this one audience, maybe in psychology, but actually in this part of the research project, this is going to have more relevance for those in, say, strategic management. So suddenly you start carving out different angles on your work. And you can start developing those. And when I talk about ident identifying audiences, I think that's something which I would want you to take away from today is in recognition that we write papers so that others will read them. The academic community is very vast and very diverse. What you must do by following this process is identify who is your audience. And that's an important question. Now, who is my audience? If you can think about that and identify who they are, that will take you to the right literature. It will take you to the right people in terms of who are the scholars that are publishing in that area. You read their work. You start citing them. That's how you carve out these identifiable papers from, from your research work. Now, at the bottom, I say, though, don't salami slice. And salami slicing is something which has become quite 
uh, a common phrase in the United Kingdom and certainly in the US also. You have to be careful here that we don't try and exploit our data to the extreme. And what I mean by that is we have to keep integrity. You cannot publish the same data set hundreds of times because that is effectively plagiarism of your own work. So when you do this, you're identifying component elements, make sure they are distinct, and make sure they each have a contribution that's different from the other. Has anybody heard the phrase publish or perish? Put your hands up if you've heard of that. Okay, great, thank you. So a recognized phrase. Has anyone heard of the, the publish and the perish? So rather than publish or, publish and perish. Okay, so less people have heard about this. Now the publish or perish effectively follows the premise that if I don't publish my research, if I don't, um, if I'm not able to uh, create research papers, I will perish as an academic. And it sounds quite severe, but it's very much the case. What makes this worse, and I'm not now trying to make you feel depressed about a research career, but we can still publish and we still might perish. And this brings about the issue of quality. And going back to those early speeches at the beginning, if you as an institution and you as an individual to be recognized internationally, you have to target quality journals. That is really important. It's not simply about getting papers out there. It's about targeting those that are the really high quality. And to try and give that some sense of reality, what does that mean for you? Effectively, since the beginning of 2017, I have had, uh, what am I up to now, 16 uh, research papers either published or accepted for publication. And they're all in high-ranked journals. I will often have my family or friends comment and say, wow, your work, yeah, it's going really well at the moment. And I'll say to them, well, actually, all the success I'm seeing now is the work I did three, four years ago. And actually, the work I'm doing, the work I'm truly doing now, I won't see any benefit for another two, three years. That's what a pipeline is all about, effectively. The time you invest now, you'll reap the rewards in two, four, five, even six years down the line. So this is a long journey. To give some kind of an analogy, you are like a marathon runner. It, the goal is there, you can you see it, maybe with binoculars in the far distant. It's a long way to get there. But if we recognize that, we can develop strategies to cope with that. So one of the aims, and I think this is something which um, we should all be striving for, is that we always have a research paper in the system. And what I mean by that is, always have at least one paper that is currently under review. Whilst you've always got one paper under review, you will always have output at some point. What I often see is the, the right intention. So we want to be known for our research. We want to produce good papers. I, as an individual, I want to produce strong research. But it's no good if it's sat on your desk. It's not going anywhere whilst it's on your desk. So get it into those journals. Yes, you'll get rejections, and rejections can be very mean, as I'm sure some of you would have received in the past. I receive mean rejections still. And I put that rejection letter in a metaphorical drawer, and I close that drawer, and I leave it there for at least four weeks. I open that drawer, the metaphorical drawer, look back at the comments, and actually try and be objective. Because some of the comments can feel quite personal, but what you have to recognize is they will help you improve the paper. A mixture of papers, so the bottom bullet point. Again, I truly believe in a portfolio approach. Some of your research, in fact, all of your research will be good. I have no doubt about that. But you have to recognize that the contributions of some of that research might not be that grand. Okay, They might not win you the Nobel Prize. And that's fine. What you do with that part of your research is identify journals that are still highly ranked, 
but you know that you might be able to get them in there fairly quickly, as in, let's say, within a 12 to 18 month period. That's important both for you as a person and also for the institution because it shows a production of research, which is a good thing. At the same time, you should always hold back that part of your research where you truly believe this, has, this is really great, this has something to really offer that international community. And with those papers, you spend longer. and You target the very, very top-end journals. If you have this portfolio approach, as individual but also as an institution, you'll have the volume, and year on year, you'll be producing research. But at the same time, what you'll, what you'll also be uh, cultivating is research which is at the very top of its game in the very top end journals. So this is what really your portfolio should look like. You have a short to medium term set of papers, which are good, but they're not going to be groundbreaking. And then you have those for the long term. And again, these are the sorts of terms that we're talking about. So naught to three years, really, for your short to medium term papers. Typically, it'll be over three years for those papers in the very top business and management journals. So one set, key to securing employment, and that can be securing tenure. It can be about securing a, a, a lectureship, a post. Those on the right, they're key to your promotions. That might not necessarily be within the same institution, but internationally, if you want to contribute to that international community of scholarship, hitting those top papers will allow you to do that. You'll be invited to do these sorts of talks, you'll be given job offers in other countries, and you build that network, and it's exciting. So how do you keep the motivation? Now this is as applicable to an undergraduate student, I believe, as it is to a professor like myself. One thing that worked very much for me, and I think it hopefully could work for you, is to keep a visual representation of your ideas. So if you have any research ideas in mind, that could be your master's project split into different component elements. It could be different research models that you want to investigate, so very quantitative models. But it could just be themes or questions. Do you think there needs to be answers to these questions? in your office, in your bedroom, wherever it might be, you have them up on a wall. You visualize them. So for the first eight, nine years of my career, I had a whiteboard in my office, which had all those models or paper ideas that I had in mind that I wanted to work on. Why is that important? Well, if you go back to that very early slide where we talked about the context of demands in our teaching, demands in our time to be a mentor or a coach, demands our time to produce the research. It's very difficult to manage all that. If you have a visual representation, it means it's constantly there. It's in your consciousness. So there's no danger of you forgetting about it. And that can really help drive you and motivate you. And those times when you're not thinking about research, because you're seeing it in your subconscious, you will be figuring it out, the problems, you'll be working it out. It's amazing how often, and to the annoyance of my wife, that I'll uh, wake up at midnight or one in the morning and have a bit of a eureka moment. I'm not thinking about my research, but my mind is. And suddenly I've solved a problem. <laughs> might sound pretty unexciting, but when it happens to you, it is exciting. Um, so how do you build your pro profile? Dissemination is key. So conferences, workshops, doctoral symposiums are wonderful because you're meeting the next generation of professors here but also web profile. So just out of curiosity, how many of you, of you in the room are members of academia.edu? Okay, a few of you. How about ResearchGate? Okay, kind of the same hands. And who has a Google Scholar profile? Okay, so a couple or three, and that's, that really is brilliant. The great thing about the likes of ResearchGate, for instance, is that you can actually start a conversation with leading voices in the field. So just very recently, I was in communication with Gerard Hodgkinson, who's done an awful lot around behavioral decision making. And I'll talk about that tomorrow. And I sent him a message and said, Professor Hodgkinson, we're not related. Um, well, maybe we are, who knows? Uh, 
And I said, this paper that you have looks very interesting. Could you send it to me? Because I couldn't get access. And within 10 minutes of sending that message, we've never spoken, he sent me the paper. So these are really effective ways of, of tapping into that network. But it's more than just having a presence on those different sites. It's about actually using them. Again, you know, rewards aren't immediate often, but you build this profile and it allows you to start these conversations which you might find can really help you a year down the line, two years down the line, even further. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about this balancing of the demands because I really do think that's critical, particularly for an institution that's looking to really establish themselves as a research player globally. So why is balance important? So there's lots of different reasons why balance is important. What this is showing is that we as academics, we juggle many, many balls. It is very, very difficult. Sometimes what we forget is that we as individuals need to keep our sanity and we need to keep our happiness. That can sometimes be very challenging. That should always be your priority. All these other things are important, but you have to maintain some perspective on them. So how do we do that? So this is what can sometimes happen. And it certainly happened to me in my early career. All this other stuff on the right-hand side can suddenly become so overbearing that it dominates your time. But importantly, what it does, it dominates your research time. For those of you who are maybe starting out in academia, or those of you that may be wanting to get your research activities back on track, about four years ago, I said to myself, every day, I'm going to do a piece of research. Not including the weekends, we have to have a life, but every day, I'm going to do a piece of research. What does that look like? Well, on those really busy days, when maybe you're, you're teaching all day, maybe you've got lots of meetings, whatever it is, if you can find 20 minutes or half an hour to do a small piece of research, whether it's reading a new journal article that you've not read before, whether it's mapping some ideas, whatever it might be, you do that. And what you'll find is that over time, that builds into a big cumulative effort. So doing a little bit every day suddenly builds into this big research effort. And I truly believe that is why, if anyone looks at my Google Scholar profile, that is why my productivity in the last couple of years rocketed up. That's how you get the outputs going. But also, I think it, it also keeps your enjoyment and your engagement with your research, that you're not having to forget about it for periods of time and come back to it. It's actively there at the forefront of your mind. What worked for me, time management, and, and making sure research was always featured in my, in my time management every day. Looking for synergies. So I remember saying to myself when I started out teaching, I teach strategic management, I said, I want to get to the point where in every class I can recommend a journal paper that I've written. Not because there's any royalties or monetary uh, value to that, because there isn't, but purely because I want to be able to show my students this is what cutting research, uh, edge research is, looks like, and this is what I'm doing, along with other articles, but to always have one of my papers there. Suddenly you have synergies then, because the preparation for that teaching suddenly gets massively reduced because you're talking about your paper that you, you wrote, that you did. Accepting conflict, you know, recognizing that sometimes you have to deal with things that are in conflict. Thinking in an abstract way, theoretically, is in stark contrast to having a budget meeting about bought-in teachers or whatever it might be. So accepting conflict and just welcoming it. And energy, you know, keep those energy levels up. So I think if you can find something which you really enjoy within your research, really focus on that and use that to motivate you. And that is a steep learning curve, but when you're active and when you find out what works for you, that's when a career in academia can be wonderful. It takes a long time to get to that point, but it can be wonderful. Okay, what are the barriers that you'll face? It's very similar to doing your PhD in a sense. Lack of direction, being left to your own devices, conflicting pressures, that overload. Now this second to bottom is an important point. Inappropriate priorities. 
whether you're an undergraduate student or whether you are a professor, there is a tendency to always focus on those things where we get immediate gratification. So what might that look like for an undergraduate student? Let's say you're writing your, your report. I'm going to put my contents page together. Oh, I get immediate reward there because suddenly, oh, look, my contents page goes from page one to page 40. Look how much I've done. It makes you feel good. But actually, it doesn't really help prove or do anything. As a professor, we could focus on purely on uh, teaching because you know if you teach a good class, you get immediate positive feedback. It's a nice feeling. But you can't do that to the neglect of the harder stuff. And it is about making sure you don't lose sight of what you're trying to do. You're trying to become globally recognized for your research and be a good teacher and be a strong academic. And lack of feedback, and this might be very UK specific, I don't know, but when I started out on my uh, tenure track, we call it probation in the UK, someone said to me, the best you can ever hope for is no comment. I said, what do you mean? And the person said, no, literally the best you can ever hope for from your colleagues is that they won't say anything to you. That means you're doing really well. If you start hearing lots of negative things, that means you're not doing well. The point there was you have to be very self-motivated. Celebrate the wins. So when you think about research, when you get a revise and resubmit decision, you're still in it. Celebrate that. You've suddenly got an opportunity now to respond to reviewers. You know, you're another step to getting it accepted but you celebrate those small victories. Some tips for you, and I think these are generally life tips, um, and I think these will help you no matter what you go on to do, whether you stay in academia uh, or whether you're, you've been in it for the long haul. I guess a couple of points I'll just pick up on is whilst we should always be assertive, and that might mean actually saying no sometimes and saying, no, sorry, I can't take that on. I'm already doing this. You can't please everyone. At the same time, always being friendly to everyone you meet. Academia is a small world. Within your institution, your administrative staff or support staff, that's what, is that, is that, yeah? The administrative staff, they make your life so much easier. But they can also make it a uh, living hell if they don't like you. So be nice to everyone, it's really important. But also at networking events, there's a good chance the people you're meeting will be reviewing your work. And whilst it's typically anonymous, so they won't know whose work it is, as you progress your career, people know how you write, people know what you're writing about. So I know I can submit to a certain journal and I know those reviewers will know that I wrote the paper. And if I was really mean to them or unpleasant to them in some other forum, you know it's going to come back on you. And I think the scholarly community is one of cohesion and supporting each other, and I, I truly believe in that. Okay, publishing in top journals. Now, I put top secret there uh, out of some form of irony, but actually we can't record the rest of this um, for the purposes of wider dissemination. Yeah, so my, that's fine. So you can record my voice. Okay. Now, the irony, the irony here is that this stuff isn't top secret. That's the irony. But because this, has been, uh, this content has been developed um, with a colleague of mine who agreed to allow me to talk about this stuff that I'm going to show you, um, we didn't know it was going to be filmed, so it would be unfair to, to do that. Um, so it's very ironic, because this isn't top secret stuff. And that's what I really wanted to hammer home today. That's a bit of a, a British saying, hammer home. That doesn't literally mean taking a hammer at any building that you call home. Publishing in top journals, there's a degree of formula to it. If you don't know the formula, you won't get in. It's as straightforward as that. If your article looks different, stylistically, in its format, in its structure, it won't get in, and that's guaranteed. So a big part of this is actually understanding what is the formula 
to get into that journal that you want to get into, to get in that top rank journal. Just to give you some context, so I'm an associate editor of journalist service management, and these are trends that we're seeing, but as are the majority of the top business management journals. Article submissions are really increasing. They're going through, literally through the roof. Desk rejections. Is anyone in here, anyone in here brave enough to say that they've had any desk rejections recently from a journal? Well, I can definitely put my hand up. I've had two very recently, and it hurts. So desk rejections where you, you submit your great, unbelievable, groundbreaking work to a journal, and the editor says, no, it's not for us. So it doesn't even go out to review. So that can be a little bit upsetting. However, you put it in that drawer just for a little bit of time. You put it back out, and you say to yourself, well, at least I didn't go through six months or 12 months to eventually get a rejection. So I can now flip this and send it somewhere else. Submissions from emerging markets, really on the up. Ultimately, because many institutions are recognizing the key to having that global presence is through research. You build that research profile through publications. Focus on those very top tier journals. I think A1 is the guys, but it's the same as four star. The very top tier. The focus on those has gone, again, um, has increased rapidly. But acceptance rates, steeply in decline. For the top tier journals, you were typically talking about a 5% acceptance rate. So only 5% of all those that get submitted to that journal will be accepted. That's a tough environment. But it makes the formula ever more important. Now, some criteria here, and I'm not going to read through it. I don't expect you to read through this straight away. But there's three criteria you should always judge your work by. Originality, significance, and rigor. If you can be objective and view your work under those three criteria, you stand a much better chance of recognizing prior to the review process what needs to be, what needs to be changed, what needs to be addressed. Doing this for your colleagues, or even if you're a, a student, having a peer read your work and comment on it under these headings of originality, significance, rigor. It will improve your essays and improve your report. For an academic, it means that often, before going to that review process, those weaknesses that would have got it rejected can be addressed straight away. They're the three criteria that the top journals will focus on. For those of you maybe not familiar with how journals are classified, this is your typical classification. So four being the very top, or A1 or A star, right down to maybe one or C. I use the Harzing Journal Quality Guide, and a link can be used there. The reason why I use that is because all journal quality guides have flaws or biases. That might be because of uh, the country they originate from. It might be because of uh, political biases that certain um, contributors those journal quality guides have. The Harzing Guide covers all of those that are recognized, all the recognized journal quality guides in one place. Really useful when you're thinking about where do I want to target or in recognizing what are the top journals in my field. The unclassified, we typically aren't concerned with those. Sometimes when it's a very wacky paper and you think it needs to get out there, you might not be bothered about the ranking. But for most of us, with limited time frames, we want to work on research papers that we know are going to get into high rank journals. So what's a four or A1 or A star, or in other words, a world leading journal? What's it look like? These are the characteristics of it. For any student who's writing an essay, writing a report, or doing some research at the moment, you know that if you look at those leading journals, you'll get typically the best material from there. That will only strengthen your work. It's the same for academics. If I'm trying to build my literature review, in doing so, if I'm really trying to identify what are the research gaps, 
and link to that, what are the contributions that I'm making? You identify those by looking at those sorts of journals. When you do that, straight away, you're engaging with the conversations that are happening in those outlets. That's incredibly important because it goes back to the issue around following the formula. If you don't engage with the conversations in those top journals, yet you're targeting those top journals, you will get desk rejected straight away because they will say, we don't see the contribution being offered here. We don't see the fit with the journal. So really good place to go. But if you look at the characteristics, super difficult. Okay, three star publications or, or A, A rank journals. Again, a lot of this stuff, you think, yeah, my, you know, my work's showing this. But it's the difference between a self-perception of what we believe our work is showing versus the objective reality. I think, again, if you can almost treat your work as though it's been done by someone else and you review your own work, you take on, you put on the hat of a reviewer and you go through your work, you'll often find that actually we fall short on quite a few of these things. Now again, this is not a perfect science, and you should never take these general quality guides as being uh, the gospel truth. There are a number of two-star publications in my field, two-star journals, where their impact factor is much higher than the four class journals in that same field. So think about the different metrics there are that, that exist. So impact factors being one of those. Don't always stick rigidly to this. Now ultimately, I think this is where most of our work does sit. Providing valuable knowledge to the field or subfield and to the application of such knowledge. Contributing to incremental and cumulative advances in knowledge in the field and subfield. Thorough and professional application of appropriate research design techniques, investigation, and analysis. That's what most of us are striving for, actually, yet not ranked very high, those journals. And this is their, if we think about originality, rigor, significance, this is what they're hitting. So what do we do then if, really, most of our research is in this realm? Again, it goes back to that formula, how you position your work, how you identify the contributions, the research gaps, how you sell your paper. Most reviewers will decide, after reading the introduction, whether this is going to be a revise and resubmit decision or whether it's going to be a rejection. So the most important part of your paper for hitting the characteristics, not of the two, but of the three of the four, so the A1, the A's, is that introduction. So what I'd encourage you all to do, if we'd had the time I would have done this with you in this workshop, is take the introduction of the top one of the top um, journals in your field, look at a recent article, take the introduction, and analyze that introduction. It works really well. I've done it with undergraduate students for critical thinking. But importantly for academics, it's very important. Because what it shows you is the formula, how you structure that introduction, how you make the cell how you position it, how you show the contribution, how you show the, the rigor, the significance, the originality. So I'd really encourage you, if you're interested, to, after this session, over the next few days, if you get time, to, to do this. Because it can be really, you can learn an awful lot. And that's what I mean by that formula. You, f you look at the formula in those top journals and you effectively then seek to imitate it. Look at how they build the narrative in the introduction. Imitate how they do that. Obviously in your own words, obviously using your own research. But that is one of the best ways to learn. So what are the characteristics for those top tier journals? What I've tried to do here, and this, a lot of this is informed by my colleague who sat on the research assessment framework in the United Kingdom. And that is a, a body that assesses the quality of outputs by institutions. And these are what he recognizes being the key characteristics of those journals and those, importantly, those outputs that were ranked the highest by that panel. 
Now, if you take each of these, they're very difficult to show. But I think, importantly, right from the beginning, beginning of a research project, we can be targeting these aspects. So almost in design, we can start ensuring that we're factoring these things into our research papers. And if you truly are going to publish in the top tier journals, these sorts of things are expected. To the point whereby, if an ed editor in chief isn't convinced that your paper is showing a number of these, again, it's very likely it's going to get desk rejected. And like I said, even I still fall into the trap of not necessarily not having factored these in to the design, but sometimes we get so close to our work that we forget how to articulate it and how to present it in the paper. And for many of us, we often undersell our work. I was reviewing very recently, in this paper that I was reviewing, there were no contributions in the introduction. Now straight away, as a reviewer, I'm thinking that's a rejection, straight away. So two pages in, I'm pretty much already rejecting that paper. In the rest of it, they now have to convince me that I should go back on my decision, which is a tough, tough ask. You need to get the buy-in from the reviewer straight away. Contributions are pretty important, but if you can show these things in the introduction that they're part of the paper, they're part of the research, that's an incredible, incredibly good way of doing so. Now, I've got some questions here, and these questions are both for you as individuals to reflect on, but I think also the institution would really benefit from reflecting on some of these questions. Because ultimately, you as an individual can strive to be the best teacher in the world and the best researcher in the world, producing the best quality work. And you need to think about how you can do that by keeping sane and happy as well. However, the institution, the environment you work in plays a big part. Of course it does. If you're given 20 hours of teaching a week, can you really produce top quality research? Unless you're willing to work evenings, weekends, which I would never want anyone to do, I don't think it's healthy, you're not going to do that. You can't, it's impossible. So the institution will have some tricky questions to ask itself. But as I said earlier, I teach strategic management. I consult on strategic management. I would never go into a firm and say, this is what you should do. Why? Because they know so much more about their firm than what I could ever know. However, my job would be to say, are you asking the right questions? And I'd really hope that the questions we have here will hopefully lead further debates at the institution, both at the individual level but at a collective level, to think about the answers we get from these questions. Does that mean we need to change what we do? Does it mean that we are doing certain things really well, which you will be, but identify those and really look after them, but at the same time recognise where improvements can be made? So I hope you find those questions helpful. I guess the final thing to remember is there are no shortcuts. So you'll see in the image there that this chap is going to the co-author's party and he's number 21. Okay. There are papers that exist where there's 20 plus authors and sometimes that's perfectly legitimate. If we have 20 plus data sets from 20 countries, you would expect there might be 20 plus authors. However, it's very rare so don't look for those shortcuts because it will damage you in the long term. And good luck. <laughs> and that's me done. So what I'd like to do now is really open the floor up to questions. It's good because wow, I've wowed everyone, so that's, that's fine. Also, like you said, if you don't let your passions hide, you have to be professional to do it. So you won't be in the <laughs> I think the point is, um, how do you see the role of the, the, the institution, the university? Because um, it's 
talked a lot, we talked a little bit about the institution, and you talked a lot about your uh, role and how important do you feel are in terms of making your research take off and, uh, and really get some good results with these uh, good publications. Um, how we also get support from the university and the institutions rather than just get only the magazines or teaching stuff, which is important. However, one day you need to decide if you want to be teaching or just teaching university research and research. So how do you see that? Um, can you just share a bit that? Yeah, that's a really, it's a great question. And if I um, had the answer, I'd be a very wealthy man uh, because there'd be many institutions who'd like to know the truth, the answer. I think what I'd probably say is that there is sometimes a danger of feeling a little bit as though it's us and them. So us as in the individuals who are doing their very best, working very hard, being pressured to do more and more, and then the institutions maybe pushing them to do more and more, and it can create a divide. I think what's really exciting about this university is that there's a shared desire to become more research intensive and to become recognized on that global platform as a research player. So there's this collective goal. For me, the key thing is then, how do we together accomplish that? Those questions that I pose there, I think, personally set up a good structure for an away day. So being a strategist, I like my strategic away days, of course. We wouldn't have a consultancy career if there weren't away days. So a strategic away day, get it, getting out of your headspace, having representatives from across the levels, right from junior members of staff, right through to those uh, individuals who are central to the management of the institution. Recognizing it's a safe space and saying to ourselves, look, we are going to disagree and that is okay. What we need to do is be open and really think about what are the answers to these questions? What can they look like? What should they look like? I truly believe if you do that, that creates the strategy to move forward because suddenly you have a collective buy-in. And the only way to accomplish some of the things that was, were talked about at the beginning, to, 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 to accomplish those things, it's a joint effort. It can't be a top-down, okay, now we need better research because that doesn't create better research. Just telling people to do better research doesn't make better research. So that's quite an, an invasive answer I don't know if I really answered it directly, but I think we have to have that joint thought process and working together to figure out what makes an effective environment for us, because every institution is different. But thank you for your question, Igor. Any other questions in the room? Yes. Uh, it was oh. a perfect question, by the way. It was a brilliant question. So, Okay, okay. Uh, so uh, my name is William, and I am an uh, undergraduate student. So I don't know how to, uh, how to write or even publish uh, research, but uh, I'd like to know uh, what happens when you publish an article in a journal. You actually lose the copyright of the work so uh, is this uh, necessarily a bad thing? Uh, what are your thoughts? And that's it, basically. Okay, thank you for your question. So thank I you. I want to start by saying research has a massive impact on you as an undergraduate student. And I think that's one of the areas that the institution can really work on. Really showing you the power of research and why through our teaching we should be showing you the findings of our research. Now that should be happening 
and it's exciting then for the person lecturing and hopefully it's exciting for you as a student because you're getting not just the textbook stuff, you're getting the cutting edge stuff. That that's ultimately what you want to know about because you are the next generation working in business and management. That can happen regardless of the copyright issues. It's again, it's a necessary evil in a sense that the publishers make their money by having the copyright of the work that we produce. And at the moment, it benefits us in the sense that if we get into those top journals because they're so hard to get into, yes, the copyright goes to the journal, but it shows that our profile is very high because we're getting in those journals. So really for me, that's not so much of an issue because we always have that freedom to show our research. Where it would infringe a copyright would be if I just decide to produce masses and masses of copies of my paper and say to my, let's say, hypothetically, I have a class of a 1,000. Here's my paper, go and read it. I might have infringed copyright by doing a 1,000 copies. However, would a good educator do that? No. Why? Because, again, we write articles for audiences. Often, that research article is not written for an undergraduate audience. So my job is to say, this is my research, this is what we did in the paper and what we found, why should that matter to you as an undergraduate student? And actually, going through that process is really important because it actually helps, one, to really articulate why the research matters. And so whilst your question was quite specific, actually, it starts to unravel lots of other things to think about. If you go back to that notion of synergies, synergy between our research and our teaching, if you're able to truly sell and articulate why your research is important to an undergraduate student and get them to really believe in that, that means that you can then articulate that research to any audience, whether it be practitioners, whether it be other academics, whether it be colleagues outside of your, your discipline field, whether it be other departments in the institution. So the short answer is, I don't think it has an impact, but actually we need to really think about what impact do we want our research to have, and so how can we get students really excited about what we're doing, because that excites me as, a, as an educator. So thank you for the question. I should say it's very nice to see the next generation of professors sat in the second row from the front, learn, learning early. <laughs> okay, that's good. Nice talk, thanks, Professor. And where can you, we, we learn more? And what do you suggest? Do you suggest any books, papers about this subject? So, okay, good question. So are you, a, are you an academic? Are you, what, what's your background? I'm a professor here. Professor. So for me, and it, it might be for different, you know, work, things work differently for different people, for me, it's about identifying in your area what is or what are the top journals. And then consistently keeping up with the readership of those journals. And specifically, the introductions. Why? Because they tell you. that. Well, that's what's great about them. They, they tell you the answer to that exact question because they tell you what is really pressing at the moment. What are the big fundamental issues? The great thing about that is that, one, it keeps us as academics attuned to where the field is, but equally, if we think about that pipeline, if I'm creating a piece of research now, that won't see the light until three years down the line. If I am simply repeating something which is in, say, a recognized textbook, what value is it going to have in three years' time when it gets published, if it gets published? The answer would be none. So I think what is great about the top-tier journal is that it identifies what are the themes that are emerging. And I think the, the challenge for us is to identify what those themes look like and what they're potentially going to be in three years so we can anticipate and preempt. 
again, for me, what helps is by integrating those sorts of conversations into undergraduate, postgraduate teaching and actually getting the students to debate some of those issues that we don't know much about as identified by those top journals. Because I find that can really help me as well, my thinking. So that has worked really well for me. And hopefully it might work well for others too. Thank you. Hello, Ian. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I think it was quite uh, motivational for me. Uh, my name is Manuela. I'm a PhD student. And I just finished my master uh, last year, and now I'm doing PhD. And I want to know, uh, in your experience, uh, if you ever get stuck in a, like a subject, you don't, you don't want to write anymore, you don't you're, you're like through it, uh, how do you do it? Uh, if you have to publish, like I have to publish uh, some papers from my master, but I want to keep going with my PhD, so I'm kind of in the middle. And uh, I have two questions, actually. This was the first one. And the second, um, if you get uh, an article that was rejected, uh, do you try to see what was wrong to correct it? And is it okay? Uh, do you suggest sending it to another journal and try it again? Okay, let me take that second question first. So, yes, absolutely. Every paper of mine has benefited from the peer review process. And that would include papers that have been rejected more than once in the past. So what you absolutely do think about that metaphorical draw. I know it sounds silly, but if you hide it away when a paper gets rejected, because there will be comments there, sometimes they can be, make you feel a little upset because it's your best work, you've tried your hardest. To let the emotion disappear, take it back out, back out of the drawer and you go through each of those comments objectively and say, okay, how could I address that? Guaranteed, it will strengthen your paper, 100%. It should then absolutely go to another journal. So you address the comments, but when you're going to another journal, recognize it is a different journal. And do recognize that they might have their own take on what it is that you're looking at, so make sure you integrate and factor that in. Sometimes there's a, a danger of assuming that if it doesn't get into a top journal, that the paper isn't good enough, or the research isn't good enough. So therefore, I should then target lower ranked journals. Now, that can become a little bit of a downward spiral, because let's say your paper has three rejections. You started at an A1 or a four level. It got rejected, you go to a three. It got rejected, you go down to a two or a C. It got rejected. Well, before you know it, you're potentially looking at unclassified. Yet, if you look at the comments you received, if you've been strengthening the paper, there's no reason why you can't go for a higher ranked journal. Because your paper's better. It's been strengthened. So perseverance is absolutely key. If I write a paper, that paper will get published somewhere. I'm not, we work too hard to waste our effort. So that should always be what keeps you going. With your first point about, I guess it's about motivation, about how do you sustain? And uh, it's a very good question. From my point of view, um, I do a lot of cross-disciplinary work, um, which means I'll be publishing in, in adjacent fields. So whether it be public management, management, marketing, international business, more niche like sport management. Each time I start a paper, it, I do, I feel a little fatigued already because I think, wow, there's so much work ahead of me. For me, it's about identifying what's exciting about the paper on a personal level and thinking, actually, I can say something here and I, I, I've got something to offer. 
And don't lose sight of that because that's what will motivate you and that's what will sustain that pipeline. If you get to a point where you feel you no longer are saying anything of value and that you're just chasing journal rankings, that's a, that would be a sad state to be in because you, I don't think you can sustain it. This is a vocation. Ultimately, we devote a lot of time to what we do. So work on what you want to work on that matters to you and believe in it. And yes, you tweak it and you, you reposition based on what reviewers say, but ultimately, the heart of your work is still what you want to do. And I just think don't lose sight of that. Hi, Ian. Hi, Ian. My name is Marco. I'm a professor with the informatics department here. Uh, I would like to ask you as a, a editor and a reviewer, what is your personal feeling or personal opinion about uh, the papers that are written in English by non-English speakers? <clears throat> Sometimes we have a paper that is not excellent English, but uh, maybe enough English to understand the point and to, the, to understand the work. But uh, when someone that is native reads the paper, uh, it, he or she starts to make some, uh, or looks at the paper with a more pessimistic way instead of looking it at, uh, uh, mm -hmm. looking it at the, trying to find the contributions, the originality and so on. What is your personal feeling? Because I know that you, you already has reviewed maybe several hundreds of papers that was written by non-English non uh, uh, mm -hmm. speaker, speakers. So it's a good question. There has to be a level of proficiency in English. There has to be, because you're communicating to an academic audience. And that's not a country-specific audience. But of course, that ability to, to communicate complex academic ideas has to be there. It, it is part of the, the rigor of a paper. But I, I completely understand your question. And this is where I think when we take on associate editor or edi editor positions, we have to commit to those roles properly. And what I mean by that is we as academics are always producing stuff to the whim of reviewers. The, the review system can be a bit of a lottery. You'd like to think in most instances it's fair, and I do believe in most instances it is, but there'll always be some biases that creep in. I really believe it's down to the associate editor who handles the paper and the editor-in-chief to be taking a strong call on these sorts of issues. I have in the past clearly disagreed and gone against reviewer comments. So reviewer comments as an editor, associate editor. Reviewer comments that have been overly harsh of say the language, and that is pretty much all the review is about. I tend to myself read that entire paper and will often contradict the reviewer because I see the merit, I see the contributions. I think probably the most frustrating thing is, is that often it's down to a lack of preparation from the author's behalf. Okay, there's no reason why the paper can't be professionally proofread, for starters. And this is, it's, it, this is why it's not a simple, if you can see the merit, it, it should be allowed through the process, because I still make grammatical errors. I will get reviewers who say, I'm not a native speaker, <laughs> when they comment on my work. And it's frustrating. However, sometimes I should kick myself because I should have either had it professionally proofread or I at least should have gone through it with a, a fine eye and done a, a grammar and spell check even. We looked at the trends with journals and the submission rates going up and up and up and up. What it effectively means now is that it is more competitive, it is harder to get papers accepted. Linked to that, Journals are stricter now in terms of desk rejecting and reviewers are less tolerant now. 
So reviewers are less tolerant of poor grammar. That's not going to change. It will only get worse as the environment becomes increasingly competitive. So whether you're a native speaker or not, there are systems in place or facilities in place to make sure that the, the level of English is, a, is at least proficient. Even um, software like Grammarly, not that I'm attempting to advertise any, <laughs> I have no involvement with Grammarly, but a free piece of software that does a grammar check. So I know it's, again, it's maybe not a direct answer, but we need to identify what might annoy reviewers and get that out of the paper before it, it gets to them. And that's certainly one of the things. I appreciate it is difficult. Another way of approaching this is through collaboration. I'm a strong believer in, in collaboration. I think it produces very strong research. It increases your productivity as well versus being a single author. Some of the greatest data sets I'm seeing at the moment are coming from emerging economies, often through the masses programs that these institutions have. You know, their students are collecting really fantastic data, data that's PhD worthy. Those who are, who are being clever about it are then networking and collaborating with those who are very good at writing. I truly believe that as academics, we bring different skills to a paper. Yes, I can write a paper from start to finish, do the analysis, etc. But I would argue that would be mediocre compared to having very strong collaborators who are specialists in certain areas. So one of the things that I will often do in partnership is the writing, the positioning, because that's the strength I have. The data analysis, however, will often be left to all my, my colleagues, my co-authors. So that's another way of looking at it. What are the strengths matching the strengths and the weaknesses so you've got a really effective publishing team. So thank you very much for all your questions. I just have a last question, Ian. Right. I think jet lag is starting to set in. I should warn you. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you. I think that's the icing on the cake. Okay. Right. Because um, you are an associate editor, and you can see things that us as authors we can't see. For example, I'd like you to comment and to suggest what not to do and what to do when you reply to, uh, to, to the reviewers. Uh, because we know that this sometimes is a little bit tricky, and people take it pers as personal. So just to finish, could you please tell us, and Share your experience with what you have been receiving and you say, well, this shouldn't be that way. Okay. That's a very good question. And th there's many things we could have spoken about with regard to publishing top journals, and that's certainly an area which is worthy of, of some discussion. When you get a revise and resubmit decision, first and foremost, celebrate that because that is an achievement. It means you've already got some buy-in from the reviewers. Often you'll have two reviewers or three reviewers they can have extensive comments. Sometimes they can be quite contradictory. Sometimes they can be quite, they can be common themes across all three. First and foremost, don't be defensive. And I do see that. Yes, this is your work. You know, yes, you're protective of it. But remember that more often than not, the reviewer is attempting to, to help you, even if sometimes it doesn't sound like they are. If you're very defensive and say, and I've seen this, we disagree with the reviewer's comment. We've therefore made no changes. As a reviewer, I've spent my time reviewing your paper, and then you get that rebuttal. Now, once you might say, OK, fair enough. It could probably be phrased better. But if you're seeing it comment after comment, no, we disagree. We've not followed. You start to get a little annoyed. I get annoyed as an associate editor. The reviewers certainly get annoyed. And you can be very confident that the paper will be rejected if you take that stance. The best way I find of laying out a response letter, which is something you produce, is you take each reviewer and each comment in turn. And you take time to reflect on that comment and take time to think, is there merit to it? How can I address that? I always do my best to address reviewer comments. 
I then address the paper. I tell the reviewer, always very politely, thank you for this comment. It is very helpful. You will see that I or we have decided to change this, this passage, etc., etc. So you talk the reviewer through what you did. Now, there may be those instances where, because a comment is contradictory, so let's say reviewer one has said change something, you've changed it, maybe it's affected the literature review, whatever. Reviewer three says something completely different about that same passage. You have to take a call because you can't please both in that instance. In my experience, normally, if you can state a clear reason as to why you went with, say, reviewer one's suggestion and why you decided not to take reviewer threes, most reviewers are pretty okay with that. They might push you again if you go through another round, but generally speaking, most reviewers are pretty comfortable with that. So take each comment in turn, typically start off with a thank you, or that's helpful, or fair point, whatever. Each comment in turn. Now, I've had a response letter that was nearly three times the length of the journal paper. The journal paper was 8,000 words. My response letter was over 25,000 words. So this is the, the magnitude of response you're having to sometimes offer. It's not a quick, I'm going to spend a day here, fire off some comments back to the reviewer, make some quick changes. You have to take your time. Typically, you'll be given three months, sometimes six months, sometimes 12 months to, to respond to reviewer comments in the top journals. Often, you need to take that time. That's how I go about it. I think it shows both the editor, that you've taken the time to really consider the reviewer comments, but also when the reviewers then read your response letter, they truly feel that they've been listened to and that they might have actually helped as well. And then you'll often get buy-in. So usually for my papers, I will on average go through three rounds of revise and resubmit. So that's why you've got time frames of two, three years. As you go through each round, hopefully you feel you're getting closer and hopefully the reviewers also, their comments start to reduce in their magnitude because they're seeing the changes that you're doing. So it's a slow process, it's a long process, but again, put that effort in, you'll get the rewards. Don't put the effort in, you know, you don't. So it's not a, it's, there's no secret to it, but I think being considerate and taking time. So Ian, thank you very much again, okay? Thank you very much indeed. Um, I think we are very lucky to have you here and all the information that, that you shared with us so um, uh, on behalf of the university, I want to say thank you very much again. I'm very much looking forward to hearing you tomorrow again. Uh, we're going to talk about another topic. It's very, very interesting, we, not just because it's a research that we're also working together, but it's really uh, interesting. So we have here uh, some certificate and some material of the university. So thank you very much again. Okay. Thank you. So. Ian will be here, so if you wanna if you wanna talk with him and please come and talk, <laughs> um, just he's gonna be here, so you can come and just say hi and you know and, and talk with him and make some questions if you want. Okay? Thank you for listening and your questions. I really do appreciate it. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, and that's the way that we finish today. So if you wanna join us tomorrow, you are very welcome. Okay. I hope you have a great day. Tomorrow is at 8, ok? 8 horas da manhã, a gente vai ter.